on this Friday night, Ontario school chaos. Solidarity! Thousands of education workers walk off the job. We've had enough of Doug Ford and the Ontario PCs taking advantage of the most vulnerable segments of society. As the province moves to have the strike declared illegal. Buckle up for political pandemonium. Why the U.S. midterms could dull Canada's auto shine. Get ready. As a former U.S. president hints at a comeback. One of the world's toughest animals in danger. They're super tough. They can survive winters. They can survive avalanches. They live in places where nobody else lives. So why are Canada's wolverines struggling to survive? Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. An anxiety-filled weekend lies ahead for tens of thousands of families in Ontario after education support workers walked off the job. Their defiance has been deemed illegal by the Ford government, and it comes after a months-long bitter standoff with the province. But today, their strike action left parents in Canada's biggest school board scrambling. We don't really know what we're going to do. It will become very challenging, yes, definitely. Um, so holiday time will definitely have to be used up. Sick days will have to be used up to uh, accommodate that child care. With no end in sight to the conflict, makeshift child care options popped up across the region. But those may not be viable in the coming days, as thousands of striking workers say they won't back down. We're going to have more on the future of the strike in just a moment. But first, Eric Sorensen begins our coverage with how we got here. Solidarity! So, so, so! Across Ontario, protests large and small by 55,000 education workers defying the Ontario government's attempt to force them to go to work. The dispute, mainly over wages, has forced many schools to close. It's gone far enough where we've been underpaid and not compensated for the work that we do. The Minister of Education and a majority government tried to bully and intimidate them, decided that they are not going to just stand for that. They the Ford government insisted children have missed too much in-class learning already from the pandemic, so an extraordinary measure was necessary, invoking the notwithstanding clause, bypassing arbitration and other legislative measures. For the sake of Ontario's two million students and their parents, schools must remain open. The notwithstanding clause was inserted into the Charter of Rights and Freedoms 40 years ago, but its use was intended to be exceedingly rare because it could override basic rights. It has turned a provincial labour dispute into a national firestorm over those rights. And we are absolutely looking at all different options. The federal government could apply its own powers to override Ontario's law, but the Prime Minister says Canadians should speak up. It should be Canadians saying, hold on a minute, you're suspending my right? to collective bargaining, you're suspending fundamental rights and freedoms that are afforded to us in the Charter? It's not the first time the Ford government has turned to the notwithstanding clause, but the pushback this time was quick. If the government is left to get away with it, every person in Canada, regardless of their political opinion, could be left with almost no Charter protections at all. Months ago, Doug Ford won a massive majority and hinted that he has public opinion on his side. You know, we live in a democracy. People spoke June 2nd very loud. Yeah, yeah. But that popularity will be tested, as will support for striking workers the longer that children now at home remain out of school. The idea that this is now going to go on for a longer period of time is very worrisome, especially um, from the academic and social emotional aspects of kids' development. The Ford government wanted a swift, simple solution that would ensure schools stayed open. What it has instead is a public tempest, and many of those schools are now closed anyway. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Let's go now to Queen's Park Bureau Chief Colin DeMello. Colin, many parents will be on the edge of their seats this weekend. So what does next week look like at this point? 
Well, at this point, we don't know. There are so many moving parts, but school boards have been told to prepare for the worst, and that means sending kids back to online learning after a two year pandemic that had a lot of kids in Ontario spending weeks behind a laptop learning uh, from far away from school. We know that the union says that they want to have a protracted strike, and the only thing that will end the strike is uh, one of a few options. Either the Ford government comes back with a new contract offer and rescinds its prior legislation, Bill 28, or if the workers themselves say they've had enough and they want to return to work. But as of right now, we've got no way of knowing exactly what this union plans to do next because even they won't reveal their options to us, Farah. So, so what could happen, though? I mean, what could trigger an end to this strike? Well, right now, the Ontario government is in front of the Ontario Labour Relations Board. They're trying to make the argument that this strike is illegal. A Bill 28, which was passed into law yesterday, made this strike by uh, the Canadian Union of Public Employees workers illegal. And so if that happens, if they get that declaration, they might be able to start handing out fines. Half a million dollars to the union itself and potentially up to $4,000 per individual employee. Uh, if those fines start start being handed out that the government is hoping those employees might cave. Although today, Unifor, the biggest union in this country, has announced they've handed over about $100,000 to this union to their strike fund. So if they've got the finances to back them, they may not back down, meaning this continues to be a stalemate and it could be that way for a few days or weeks to come. And students and parents could go back to online learning. Okay, thank you so much, Colin. Colin DeMello in Toronto for us tonight. Paying off student loans will be less of a headache for post-secondary Canadian students. One of the key measures that was unveiled in the government's fall economic update is federal student loan interest will be permanently eliminated. The average Canadian graduates with more than $13,000 in federal debt alone. The change is meant to help ease pressure. But as Abigail Beeman explains, there's concern Canadians are not getting the money when they need it. Money is tight for second year student Andy Suarez. I have to manage my rent and I have to manage my food. I can't spend too much on food. I have to more or less ration what I can buy from Walmart. And he's luckier than some with help from family and federal student loans. I have Let's say about 20000 right now. I'm trying to look uh, to reduce that. When he graduates, he'll now save on interest. For students, we are permanently eliminating interest on Canada student loans and apprenticeship loans. That's something that we've long called for and finally is being achieved. The government says it will cost $2.7 billion over five years and save the average student $410 a year. Well, this is monumental news uh, for students across Canada. The move lauded by the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations. Students, once they've graduated, you know they're trying to establish themselves. They're looking for jobs in their field or jobs of their interest, and this takes time. Still got three years left, so good news. It's pretty difficult now with inflation and um, working and studying at the same time. But others are skeptical. This isn't a free lunch. It's a shell game because the students are going to have to pay, th uh, pay for this through higher government debt. This change in the interest rate policy affects other people whose incomes are high enough to be able to afford repayment. Under Ottawa's separate repayment assistance plan, students don't have to pay back loans at all until they make at least $40,000 a year. Christine Neal studies post-secondary policy and calls cancelling interest inefficient for getting people money when they need it. If we reduce the available funds on the student loan interest side, chances are it's going to come back to bite us in terms of less money for students up front. While many student advocates say the more help up front for students through any means, the better. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. New data from Statistics Canada shows the economy is seeing unexpected strong growth. 108,000 jobs were added in October. That's about 10 times what was forecast. The unemployment rate held steady at 5.2% as more Canadians were looking for work. Employment rose across a broad range of sectors, but it was led by manufacturing, construction, accommodation and food services. The jobs gains comes after four months of losses or little employment growth in Canada. 
The public inquiry into the federal government's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act in February to end weeks of protests in Ottawa heard from several of the so-called Freedom Convoy organizers this week. Today, the commission cross-examined far-right podcaster Jeremy McKenzie. As David Aiken reports, RCMP believe McKenzie was behind a dangerous extremist group that helped fuel the protests. In a letter he sent to senators last winter, Jeremy McKenzie described himself as, quote, the de facto leader of the so-called extremist organization known as Diagalon. But in that letter, McKenzie told senators that his group was, in fact, harmless. That, though, is not an opinion national security and police agencies share about McKenzie or Diagalon. The RCMP has described Diagalon, uh, let me be specific, has described Diagalon as a militia-like network with members that are armed and preparing for violence. On Friday, McKenzie became a reluctant witness at the commission reviewing the federal government's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. Reluctant because McKenzie was testifying from a jail in Saskatoon where he awaits trial on weapons and other charges not related to any convoy activities. But he had been in Ottawa during last winter's convoy protests. This was going to be a very significant event. It was very clear to me this was not going to be a in and out, you know, weekend protest type of thing. His presence attracted the attention of CSIS, which prepared an analytical brief expressing concern about Diagalon and McKenzie. This is a, a CSIS uh, a document, um, but it has a, a box here that says in Jeremy McKenzie's own words. Later, the country would learn that some of those arrested at the Coots border crossing and charged with conspiracy to murder RCMP officers wore some of the symbols Diagalon has adopted. McKenzie knew and had socialized with at least one of those charged. One reason why McKenzie and other Diagalon community members represented the kind of potentially dangerous presence that could have played a role in the Trudeau government's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. But McKenzie testified he represented no threat. I was just doing my best to mitigate any potential, any influence that I have um, to try to you know, push things in a, in a positive direction. The Commission's work continues Monday and will turn its focus to events in Coots, Alberta and Windsor, Ontario. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Will he or won't he? Looks like former U.S. President Donald Trump is leaning towards a possible comeback. And now, in order to make our country successful and safe and glorious, I will very, very, very probably do it again, okay? Very, very, very probably. Trump's advisors say a possible announcement could be coming in the next few weeks in order to get ahead of potential rivals for the party's nomination. But they say it's also possible he could delay or change his mind altogether. Next week's midterm elections in the U.S. could drive change here in Canada. Coming up, the consequences to our auto industry. Plus, protecting Canada's wolverines. Why the resilient animal is struggling to survive. Next week's midterm elections in the U.S. could have consequences for Canadian companies, particularly those in the auto industry. The sector supports nearly 500,000 workers and contributes $16 billion each year to this country's gross domestic product. Most of the vehicles made here are sold south of the border, but there are fears that if Republicans take control of Congress, the party will hit the brakes on Joe Biden's incentives for electric vehicles. Our Jeff Semple was recently in Detroit and has more. Well, for the first time in a long time, the sun has been shining on Canada's auto sector and on the border city of Windsor, Ontario. But with the upcoming U.S. midterms, there could be clouds on the horizon. Canada's automotive capital is in high gear. This is the Windsor Detroit Tunnel. Driven by investments like the city's new innovation hub which allows car companies to test drive products and technologies in virtual reality. Well, just down the road, this construction site is the future home of Canada's first lithium-ion electric vehicle battery plant, the result of a $5 billion investment announced last spring 
creating thousands of jobs. An incredible resurgence in the auto industry. The head of the Border City's Economic Development Group says after years of bad news, the industry is making a comeback. Around 85% of Canadian cars and auto parts are exported to the United States, where Canada's car makers recently won another victory. The Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act replaced its Buy America provision with a tax credit for green vehicles produced in North America. It encourages adoption, which supports the manufacturing, and it benefits the North American partners, so it's, 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 it's phenomenal. But there is concern that a Republican-controlled Congress might pull a U-turn. The Liberals and the Biden administration are clueless and out of touch. Republican candidates are campaigning against the $7,500 tax credit, with ads condemning electric vehicles as expensive and un-American. Every Republican voted against the omnibus bill, and if they take control of Congress, they could interfere with its implementation. It's possible for opposition Congresses to undermine the intent of those policies through budgets, through uh, other procedures and mechanisms. U.S. automakers are also pushing back, warning few vehicles would even qualify for the tax credit because North America doesn't currently produce enough battery components. So there are a lot of things that need to be worked out still. We foresee some tinkering. This Michigan auto industry rep expects there will be changes to the electric vehicle incentive program. But one way or another, the industry is going green. The political debate around electric vehicles, does that worry you? Does that worry the industry? No, because the market forces are going to drive it ultimately. The market needs to be supplied, so the companies press on. Biden's bill also provides incentives for manufacturers to build their EV batteries in the U.S. That could make it harder for Canada to compete. The manufacturers are going to go where it makes the most business sense to go. And right now, the U.S. is really putting the full court press on th that entire carbon transition ecosystem. So, of course, we're curious to see how that pans out and how that gets written up. A lot is riding on how Washington moves forward with its EV agenda. Regardless of who wins on November the 8th, Canada's auto sector is confident they're on the road to revitalization. Jeff Semple in Detroit. And we're going to have full coverage of the midterm elections next week from Washington, D.C. as Americans head to the polls. Twitter employees around the world are finding out today if they still have a job. It comes after speculation and uncertainty about the future of the company under its new owner, Elon Musk. Internal plans leaked earlier this week show Musk wants to cut 3,700 staff members, or about half of Twitter's staff. At least two of those let go today were in senior positions in the company's Canadian office. Musk, who is the world's richest man, wants to slash costs and impose a demanding new work ethic. At least one photo posted to social media this week showed an employee sleeping at the office in order to meet deadlines. Ahead, a royal affair on climate change. The king hosts world leaders ahead of a major summit. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has spoken out publicly for the first time since his assassination attempt yesterday. He is accusing his successors of being involved in a plot to kill him. Speaking from a wheelchair at the hospital where he's recovering, Khan named the current Pakistani Prime Minister, the Interior Minister and a senior army commander as accomplices in the plot. He provided no evidence to back up the claims. The assassination attempt killed one man and wounded at least 10 others. Khan's accusations came as hundreds of his supporters clashed with police in cities right across the country. King Charles held a meeting today with global leaders ahead of the UN Climate Summit, COP27. I'm very grateful to have this. Oh, this is extraordinary. More than 200 people attended the reception, including Britain's new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. The king is well known for being outspoken on environmental issues, but he will not be attending COP27. Charles has indicated he's going to step back publicly from championing such causes since becoming monarch. The United Nations conference begins this weekend in Egypt. They are mysterious animals, but the wolverine population in western Canada is dwindling. I'm Heather Urex west in Banff National Park. I'll have that story coming up. 
Despite having a tough reputation, new research shows that the population of one of the world's most elusive animals, the wolverine, is rapidly declining in Canada. As Heather Yorks West explains, the species appears to be struggling due to human impacts, including climate change. Mysterious, beautiful, and incredibly fierce. Wolverines thrive in some of the harshest areas of Canada's Rockies, places where other animals do not. They're just so incredible, right? They're super tough. They can survive winters. They can survive avalanches. They, they live in places where nobody else lives. And yet, according to new research, these animals are in trouble. So when they walk in, they leave hair. After collecting DNA from hair samples and videos of the animals for over a decade in Western Canada's Banff, Yoho and Kootenai National Parks, a team of researchers have made a sobering discovery. It was a bit of a wake-up call for us researchers. We didn't expect what we found. Even within the relative safety of the national parks, the wolverine population is dwindling, down almost 40% since 2011. And a big reason for that is climate change. We know what wolverines need to thrive. They need very large connected habitat that's also that doesn't have a lot of disturbance from people. They also need snow. They, do, they are a cold adapted species, there's no adapted species. The good news is this part of the Rocky Mountain Range in BC and Alberta is warming at a slower rate than other areas. But even here, the population has declined. In response to the numbers, Parks Canada has made changes to a small area of the Kootenai National Park to limit human activity around wolverine habitats. That just means that that's a place where we're going to reduce our trail maintenance, try and reduce human presence and allow wolverine to, to use a place like that without very much human presence. In 2020, just after researchers finished collecting their data, the BC government introduced a limit of one wolverine per trapper per year. But now that this study has revealed how sensitive the population is, researchers hope more restrictions will follow. Here looks like a nice wolverine track. Or tracking these elusive creatures may become even more difficult, with fewer and fewer left in the parks to find. Heather Urex West, Global News, Lake Louise, Alberta. You're mesmerizing. That's Global National for this Friday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and tonight's Your Canada is Banff, Alberta, as seen from the top of Sulphur Mountain. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night.